Why Bitcoin Cash? What is Bitcoin Cash good for? Well, just like Bitcoin, with a small adjustment, Bitcoin Cash makes it the digital equivalent of cash. Bitcoin Cash is a fast, secure, worldwide, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system with low processing fees. Bitcoin was just the first step. Bitcoin Cash is the next. Bitcoin Cash believes peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash is a useful tool towards economic freedom. So check out Bitcoin Cash at whybitcoincash.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Jiu-Jitsu Motivation Podcast. My name is Greg Melita, Black Belt, owner of Hamptons Jiu-Jitsu. And I'm Brian DeLuca, Black Belt and author of Jiu-Jitsu for Small People, another weird shit I think about. <laughs> I, can't, I can't help but laugh on that. I know, it's Brian. funny. That's, That's why I named it. I named it. Title. I know I'm working I'm working on the next I'm working on the sequel but let's see All right. there. <laughs> um, so guys really happy to announce our new sponsor uh, Kasai Grappling on board with us here on the podcast and uh, very excited to have Roger Beer on the podcast with us today as everybody knows here on this podcast we are uh, crypto enthusiasts and jujitsu enthusiasts obviously so to have uh, somebody on that shares both of those passions uh you know uh it's, it's really an honor so roger appreciate you coming on yeah thank you guys both for for having me so actually i mean to to a lot of people you know maybe they don't know about your you know how heavy you are into the jujitsu and how long you've been training can you go into that a little bit yeah, I've been training. Uh, actually, this year marks uh, 14. I'm sorry, this month marks 14 years of uh, wow. training jujitsu. Wow. I've been a brown belt for uh, over four years now. Uh, it's been a long, long, fun journey. A few injuries along the way, but lots of fun and, and definitely worth it. Uh, I competed in the moon deals a bunch of times at blue belt and twice at purple belt. And then the moment I, I got my brown belt, it's just been injury, injury, injury. And uh, I, I do hope, and then Corona. And so I do hope to be able to do some tournaments at brown belt. But, uh, you know, I'm 43, so I... I think I'm probably about time to stop doing the adult division, whereas previously I was always competing in the adult uh, 18 and over division. So, yeah. uh, brown, brown, brown belt's a hard one, man. If any time, yeah. I always say if any time during jujitsu I was going to quit, it was during my brown belt years, you know? Like yeah. it, that, was a, that was a rough like haul for me. Yeah. I, I have zero, uh, zero desire to quit, although I, I, I guess I'll confess when I first, first started jujitsu as a white belt, I thought, wow, a purple belt is just so incredibly amazing. I'll get my purple belt and maybe that'll be my last day. But then by the time I got to purple belt, there was zero chance of me quitting. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the case, right? You go through and then, you know, by the time you hit purple belt, but the brown belt, I mean, even nowadays, you know, you really look at the brown belts to see where the, where the action is. Cause those guys are hungry. They want that black yeah. belt. And you see a lot of the, um, the evolution of the art really highlighted in the brown belt levels too. So uh, where, where did you wind up starting and how did your evolution of your uh, training go over those years? Yeah. So I, I had been living in Japan since uh, 2006 and the first uh, couple of years there, maybe just, you know, not exercising so much and just having a wild time in, in Tokyo as my late, late twenties and started to gain a little bit of weight. I, I wasn't fat by any means, but like, you know, the pants started fitting tighter than they used to and said, Oh, I need some <laughs> exercise. And I wrestled in junior high and high school and I watched the early UFCs and it was so clear. I and mean, Hoist Gracie just rolled through everybody. It wasn't even a fair fight. And so I was like, okay, well, of course I'm going to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, uh, found a, found a gym in Tokyo near where I was living. And, uh, it's been, you know, haven't looked back since. And it's, uh, now actually probably arguably the first or second most uh, well-known gym in all of Asia. It's called Carpe Diem. And so maybe you can say uh, Evolve MMA out of Singapore and Carpe Diem are the two best uh, jiu-jitsu gyms in, in all of Asia. And so I've been uh, you know, proud training there. Before it was even called Carpe Diem, it used to be called uh, Triforce way back when I started. And then it became Carpe Diem a few years back. Yeah, we actually have, and uh, the academy I own in the Hamptons, we have a lot of, um, you know, black belts and visitors, and, and I have instructors from different lineages, and uh, a couple of our black belts, well, go there in Japan, or maybe once or twice a year, they absolutely love it right at that academy, that's amazing. Yeah, maybe I've even bumped into some of them, and then just one fun experience with that, uh, the, the original, like, founder of, of that kind of lineage in Japan is this guy uh, named uh, Hayakawa, and he got top eight in the worlds at I don't know, 2004, five, six, I know, a while ago. But, you know, if you get top eight at the Mundials, like you're, you're no joke. And I remember rolling with him as a purple belt. And I was a pretty decent purple belt at that point. And, I, and he's just tapping me over and over and over again. And, and Japanese people are always so humble, right? And I asked him, I said, what am I doing wrong? And his response to me is, no, 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 you're not doing anything wrong. I'm just too good. 
<laughs> so <for a> time, <laughs> that was really something. And just Sometimes the translation, uh, you know, speaks yeah. truth more than, uh, yeah. you know, if you were in the original language. <laughs> yeah, it made me appreciate just how deep the art is and just, uh, you know, how much additional room there is to progress. That's, you that's you got a really unique view training jiu-jitsu in, in, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Japan because, you know, a lot of people obviously with the history of, you know, Hicks and Gracie and, and the Gracie family and Japanese jiu-jitsu and Maeda going to Brazil and all of that, you know, it's interesting to see that the Japanese people, like, really, you know, from what I understand, really embrace uh, the evolution of Brazilian jiu-jitsu as opposed to people would think, like, you know, very defensive. Um, you know, it seems like... Uh, Really, really awesome that that you know, in especially in Japan, Brazilian jiu jitsu art has really been embraced over there. Yeah, I don't know anybody doing Japanese jiu jitsu in Japan, but there's you know, <laughs> jiu -jitsu, Brazilian jiu jitsu gyms all over Tokyo. There's more than I can count. It's really incredible the, the density. And there's in, in Tokyo is a big city, but there's literally there's a jiu jitsu tournament pre COVID anyhow, almost every single weekend. If you want to wow. compete in a competition, there are tournaments at, at least two or three times a month, if not every weekend. Wow. It's pretty. It's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Now you said you you grew up wrestling, right? Greg and I also grew up wrestling. How much did you find like yourself wrestling at first? And did you continue wrestling? Did you convert more to like a jujitsu style? Did you use a mixture? In in my white and blue belt days, it was almost all wrestling. But the downside of that is that I didn't know, you know, putting my arm here, or leg there, like I didn't know what was dangerous and what wasn't, and it really took a while before I uh, found out you know, what's dangerous and what's not. And then, and then my game, I'm just, I still prefer being on top, but my, my, you know, being on my back is okay too. Whereas a wrestler, that would, you know, just be unimaginable. Yeah. The first few years was horrible being on your back. You know, you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. You really learn like, you know, uh, limb extension to not really extend your limbs. You know, I tell a lot of my students all the time, like you don't want to totally unlearn your wrestling mm -hmm. because it's yeah. such a great base. You just need to adjust a few things, hide the neck, you know what I mean? Respect the guard, get around the legs first before you're going to apply pressure, uh, you know, those type of things. But I mean, I, I really see the fusion of wrestling and jujitsu, you know, intelligently yeah. going on about, you know, in the evolution of the sport now to where, you know, utilize switches, utilize uh, funk rolling, uh, utilize scrambles, you know, almost giving your back to turtle to stand up and escape. You see a lot more of that in jujitsu now. So it's really cool um, to see. In, in Japan, it was extra helpful, actually, because, you know, in the U.S., there's tons of wrestlers. In Japan, there's not so many wrestlers. So I'd go into these tournaments, and there's all these judo guys in the tournaments. Right. And they yeah. stand up perfectly straight, and they're not used to having people grab their legs. So I would get free takedowns, you know, all the time in tournaments. And there were plenty of tournament matches I won just from the two points from the free takedown. And, and, and that, was, that made the difference in the match. And so, like, that in Japan comes, came in very handy uh, in, the, in the actual tournament settings. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I, I find myself, like like as I keep going on in my journey, right? Like reincorporating more wrestling as I've gotten better at my jujitsu portion, mm -hmm. like bringing the wrestling back in a lot more and just, you know, utilizing some of that. Do so you notice you started doing that the, the higher level you got because you can't really do yeah. that in the beginning because you're not, you know, you don't have the base of just jujitsu yet and the knowledge of yeah. jujitsu and knowing what to do before you can bring in, you know, other knowledge. Kind of got to go in with a blank canvas, you know, even though you learned other stuff, but as you yep. get higher rank and then you bring some of the other things you know in and that's interesting with the judo because i mean they're so used to that that upright posture yeah, but, it's great in judo you know but, but for wrestling uh, it's a free takedown yeah <laughs> yeah yeah to basically give you a shot you know what i mean and an yeah. entry right into the legs so but yeah actually uh i like to switch it up a bit and how did you i mean you're, you're considered a og investor in, in the crypto space and pioneer how did how did like Go even further back, and how did you even stumble upon it, discover it, and realize before anybody else, this is going to change everything? Yeah, so I, I'm not a jiu-jitsu black belt yet, but I'm definitely a cryptocurrency black belt. Um, <laughs> I'm you know, basically the, one of the oldest people in the entire space there. I set up the first non-illegal website, uh, e-commerce website, to accept Bitcoin for payments, and I've been using uh, it for payments for over a decade now. And my background there was I was in e-commerce. I was selling computer parts to people all over the world. And I saw firsthand before Bitcoin, every single day we had people with stolen credit cards trying to buy my product. And so we got really good at detecting, you know, which orders are, are you know, with stolen credit cards and which orders are real. But it was, it's a real problem for merchants, especially back then. When I first got started, there was no such thing as PayPal. Uh, it was really, really difficult to be able to accept credit cards directly. And so the way e-commerce first got started on the internet, people would literally go to the post office and buy postal money orders and then ship the postal money order in the mail. 
And then later there was this company called eGold, which was really interesting concept and I was a big fan. Uh, and the way it worked is this company eGold would physically hold gold in their vaults and then you would just transfer the ownership of the gold reserve around electronically. And so you could use it to pay for, you know, $20 worth of gold from my account to your account at whatever the gold exchange rate was. And that website was really starting to take off and you know, it had crossed more than a million users and was really gaining momentum. And then the U.S. government literally came in and seized all of the gold from the company because some of the users were using it to pay for things that the U.S. government didn't like. And for myself, it's just a completely legitimate user trying to use it to sell computer parts. Mm -hmm. It was a big – I was a you know, real young man. I was, I don't know, maybe 19 when this happened, 20 years old. Um, they seized every single customer's gold. And it was a multi-year long process to be able to get any of your money back out of it. You'd have to fill out this form and that form. And I think the majority of people just gave up and, and moved on with their lives, myself included. I never got any of my money back from that website. And so it made me appreciate like the risk of these centralized systems in which they're holding everybody's gold. And then today, the risk of these centralized systems that's holding everybody's crypto. So like Coinbase and Binance and these, you know, these exchanges – they're great, useful companies, but don't trust them to hold your money uh, long term. I mean, we just saw the CEO of uh, Kraken recently saying, withdraw your money from the exchange. Don't use us as, as an account to hold the money for you. And that's why even from the earliest, earliest days of crypto, I've been an advocate of people being able to hold their money themselves so you don't have to hold it in a, in a custodian. I, I know this isn't like a, a political podcast here, but if you look at what's going on in Canada with all the truckers, the way the government's blocking them from being able to do anything is they've cut off the money supply and they're freezing all their accounts. Well, if you use cryptocurrency in an account, the government can do the exact same thing. They can still seize your money. They can block right. the payments. They can block everything. But if you use cryptocurrency in a wallet where the user has control of the funds themselves, like the Bitcoin.com wallet or blockchain.com or any of these other actual wallets that aren't accounts, the distinction between a wallet and an account is very important. If you're using a, a wallet, there's nothing that anybody in the entire world can do to mess with your money or block your payments or it's centralized or, versus decentralized. Right. Yeah. right. And and not to go too deep into crypto politics now, that's basically what the civil war within Bitcoin was when Bitcoin split into two versions, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash today. Bitcoin Cash makes it super easy for people to still have complete control of their own money in their own wallet, where the government can't block you from sending, you know, $15 of it to a trucker in Canada or anywhere else in the world. Whereas Bitcoin now, almost everybody's having to use these centralized accounts where a company has control of everybody's money and the government can go right in and say, give us all the information about this person, give us that person's money, freeze this, freeze that, undo this transaction, undo that transaction. You've like lost like 90 plus percent of the benefits of cryptocurrency and they can start doing fractional reserve, you know, cryptocurrency banking on you too, where like you think the company has, you know, uh, uh, has your Bitcoin, but really they've lent it out or done something else with it or who knows what. So um, I'm really a strong advocate of people being able to hold their own cryptocurrency themselves in a wallet that they control themselves. And so other fun facts, long, long ago, I don't know if they still managed to hold on uh, to their crypto, but I set up Coyotera with his first Bitcoin wallet a long time ago. Oh, wow. and, uh, and Andre Galval at Mundials, too. I, I pestered them. Oh. I was just like, I think, a blue belt at the time, but pestered both of them. <laughs> hey, yeah, this works. And they got oh, off their phone. And I, I sent them some, some Bitcoin way back in the day. So I hope they managed to hold on to it. So That's right. Keep their wallet. You know, You know what's interesting is now you, you're talking about like a lot of people not understanding. Do you think a lot of people think – like when they go and they create a Coinbase account or whatever, right? That that basically that money is sort of in that crypto space versus really being in a centralized system like Coinbase. Yeah, I think most people don't understand the difference, and that's why I'm trying to sound the, the alarm at the difference. Right? If if the money, if the cryptocurrency isn't in a wallet that you control, it's not your money. Somebody else has control of it. And for me, the entire point of cryptocurrency was to put people in charge of their own money, where they don't need to get permission from a bank or a government or anybody else to do what they want with their own money. And you have to use a wallet in order to do that, not right. not some account based system. You know, and I guess my here's my question, right? So for for someone who's just starting out. Right. So the difference, you know, like Coinbase or whatever, and I'm not picking on Coinbase, I'm just you can pick any of them, right? They're, they make it really easy. It's not much different than their banking system or how they're maybe investing in stocks or whatever the case is. Whereas when you create a wallet, it's sort of like a totally different process. And I think it's a little foreign to people. Maybe that's why some people gear or lean towards simpler things like Coinbase, which is not a good thing, you know, at the end of the day. I, maybe I disagree with the last part. Like Coinbase has been an amazing platform to bring new people into cryptocurrency without yes. any doubt. And they have a yes. really easy to use product that does make it easy for, for normal people to use crypto. But um, these wallets have gotten really, really easy as well. So like the, the Bitcoin.com wallet, and that's my own company, 
So take that for what, it, what it's worth. But that wallet is so easy to use. It really is. Another wallet that I have nothing to do with that I also think is really easy and great to use is a trust wallet. That wallet is fantastic uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's lots of really easy to use wallets today, whereas, you know, a, a decade ago, there was almost nothing in the way of a wallet. So it's definitely right. gotten easier uh, over time there. But it's really important for people to understand those distinctions. And everybody in America, they think, oh, nothing bad can you know ever happen here in terms of the banking system. But I don't think that's the case. It can and it will yeah. at some point. Yeah. And you'll want to be able to hold your own money yourself in your own wallet. Like if the US government were to get into really big trouble, don't think that they wouldn't go to Coinbase in a heartbeat if Bitcoin was really expensive and say, hey, give us half or maybe even give us all of everybody's Bitcoin that's held in the Coinbase account. That's happened in country after country around the world where they go to the normal banks and say, hey, we're going to give every single person with money in your account a, a haircut. They, they call it a haircut, but that's just a <laughs> euphemism for theft. They just plain steal the money out of people's accounts. And if, you're, if your crypto is in a centralized exchange, you're at risk of that happening to you as well. Wasn't well, that something going around with that heist recent, recently? Like, you know, the government is a big investor in crypto now since they did that uh you know whatever happened with the heist and then they seized the the, the i think it was bitcoin and now i mean technically they hold a lot of it you know yeah um, but maybe that'll be a good thing for future regulation as well like now yeah. they're now they're now they're uh, an investor of some sort by the fact that they own some yeah i feel like i mean it's all about perspective like me being a couple years in now and it's like wow two things number one I mean, you got to know the difference, you know, trust wallet, MetaMask, mm-hmm. you know, all, all these different things, right. decentralized, what's cold storage, what's not, what, how do you actually own your crypto? How do you, you know, are you at risk? You know, uh, getting a crypto on Robinhood doesn't mean you own your crypto, you know, things right. like that. Uh, but the big thing for me, the big turning point for me was realizing that Bitcoin itself, you know, being an actual thing that is like property, it, it is physical, you know, like digital property as opposed to any other of the alts and things like that and how that is classified you know i I still think people can't really wrap their head around the fact that it is you know story like property like how i think it's hard for people you know yeah well i think most people don't ever even stop to think about what money is Mm -hmm. period it's just it's just something that that's in their life but they don't ever stop to think about it at all and I think that's actually what I attribute my ability to have, to have noticed Bitcoin so early on and get so excited about it is that my background was studying the origin of money and how something becomes money. And I studied it in books and then I actually did some time in federal prison in the United States as well. And I got to see how something naturally becomes used as money. And so something right. that's property becomes money. And so the, thing, the properties that become money are things like tobacco right because it has this additional use case you can smoke it you can store it for a long time it doesn't go bad it's easily recognizable it's easily transportable it has all of these characteristics to make it useful as money when bitcoin first came on the scene it had all these characteristics where i knew naturally people would just start using it as money and then you know not to dive too deep into this whole bitcoin civil war that went on but bitcoin's usefulness as money was severely damaged in terms of its transportability they made it really really hard for you to be able to send and receive bitcoin with other people uh and the fees became really really high and the transactions on average were taking more than two weeks at the end of 2017 for your transaction to go through and the transactions could be reversed during that time as well and like the vast majority of people that came to crypto today have no idea but if i can plug a a website called whybitcoincash.com it'll paint a very very clear uh understanding of the differences between what's called bitcoin today and what's called bitcoin cash well that that leads to my next question not to jump in there but i had that in my notes it was now you know bitcoin looked at as a as a you know as a way of like a um stored store of value property but when you want to actually interact and you know make transactions that leads us to bitcoin cash now and on that note and you talked about two weeks of transactions taking and all of that did you ever receive your bitcoin from tone base no he cheated (laughs) (laughs) he he cheated in multiple different ways and then never paid up but i shouldn't be surprised to be honest and then charlie lee did the same thing to me as well we made a bet over the lightning network stuff he clearly lost and they hemmed and hawed and this and that never paid up his part of the bet and never and if he genuinely thinks he won he refused to try and collect for me i i said <laughs> anyhow i'm i'm kind of tired and over with all that <laughs> you guys and, are, you know I'm not, anybody <laughs> listening to this, you, know, uh, you guys don't know what i'm talking about it was a really good debate on you know bitcoin and bitcoin cash and what was quicker what was cheaper in transactions what's better for people to actually make transactions with and it, it was just uh you know, Roger was right up there. Hey, show me. Let, let's see. You know, do it right now. Seventy-five dollars in Bitcoin, and it was uh, it, it was really cool to see. Like, actually, 
in, in the use case, what would be an actually better way of actually making a transaction, you know? Um, yeah. And, and speaking of that, um, anybody, when this podcast goes live, anybody, if you email me at roger at bitcoin.com, I'll send you $1 in Bitcoin cash. And it's not because $1 is a lot of money. It's because it's a little bit of money and it's something that's no longer possible to do on Bitcoin. Otherwise, mm. I'd be out there cheerleading for Bitcoin. But what I'm really cheerleading <laughs> for is peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world. And I think Bitcoin cash is the best functioning peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world. So anyhow, pop me an email over at roger at Bitcoin.com and uh, I'll send you a dollar of Bitcoin cash. You can try it out however you awesome. want. And, and it's very yeah. possible because Bitcoin cash is only about $300 as mm. we're recording it. If Bitcoin Cash becomes money for the world, that one dollar might become worth as much as a thousand dollars someday. And mm -hmm. it sounded crazy when I was telling the world about that about Bitcoin back in 2011. But it's 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 I think even less crazy to say it today because Bitcoin Cash works so incredibly well as cash. And and you hear these arguments, oh, Bitcoin's a store of value, this and that. Think about it. In the U.S., everybody uses the dollar as the store of value because you can spend it everywhere. If the dollar wasn't spendable everywhere, nobody would use it to store value. So whichever cryptocurrency it is, whether it's Ethereum or Dash or Monero or Zcash or Bitcoin Cash or, or even if it's Bitcoin, whatever cryptocurrency winds up being spendable everywhere on the Internet, that's the one people are going to use as their store of value. If it's not spendable everywhere, people aren't going to use it as a store of value. And so that's why I'm so uh, incredibly focused on the payments use case, because the payments use case, that's what enables all the other cool stuff to happen around it, including it working really well as a store of value and the price in terms of dollars going up. So, uh, mm. you know, Roger at Bitcoin.com if you want your free, possibly someday a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I'm going to be sending an email. Definitely. Yeah. That's um, right. But yeah, right. so now you can only do it yeah. one. You can't email Roger four thousand oh. times. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, so Bitcoin Cash. Now we're on that that topic. How did that? How did they wind up? You know, getting into and sponsoring Gordon Ryan in this mm -hmm. huge event for ADCC, um, which I mean, like we spoke about before we went live. I really think that you know, crypto, blockchain, the whole space is going to, and in fact is changing the world, specifically in this podcast with jujitsu guys. I really, I really think it could forward the sport even more in, in multiple use cases, but had that come about with uh, Gordon Ryan and ADCC there? Yeah, uh, it was kind of a, a last minute thing actually. So I was uh, hanging out with uh, Mo Jassim's brother, Ali, and Ali's like, hey, my brother runs all of ADCC. Let, let's let's do this. Let's sponsor. Uh, I, actually, I was telling him a story. Actually, you guys will like this story too. So I was in Japan after training one day, and uh, you know, pretty much everyone just speaks Japanese in the class there. And I'm talking with one of the, the. He was a purple belt when I first started, and so he's been a black belt now for a long time, and much better than me. Anyhow, I'm talking with this guy, a uh, Japanese guy, Yamane, right? And he's telling me about how there's this, you know, really great, uh, you know, jujitsu fighter out of the U.S. that uh, he's just leg locking everybody. And uh, and his name is the Golden Lion, <laughs> and I'm I'm thinking like, and I'm, I I don't know anybody <laughs> named the Golden yeah. Lion, like, and maybe you have an idea where this is headed already. But uh, the Golden Lion, that's that's a pretty cool nickname. But no, I I don't know who this guy is, and he's telling me, no, I'm sure you must know who he is. He's so famous, like, of course you know the Golden Lion. I'm like, no, I I don't think I know who that is. And we went back and forth for like maybe five full minutes before finally I figured out. Because in Japanese, L and R is the same letter. He wasn't talking about the golden lion. He was talking about Gordon Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think, you know, Gordon, I think that's, you have a new um, nickname ready for you. And yeah, be his new yeah. Logo there. Golden yeah. lion, his new logo. And yeah, so I Mo's, Mo's brother this story. And they said, hey, let's call, uh, you know, he knows Gordon Ryan. said, so let's call him right now and, and chat with him and tell him the story. And then uh, within a day or two before I knew it, uh, Bitcoin Cash, but between you know Mo, Ali, and myself, uh, Bitcoin Cash was the sponsor of the next ADCC, and Gordon Ryan uh, specifically. So that was kind of the the intro. There it was a, cool. a Japanese language lesson that led to the sponsorship of ADCC. That's that's awesome. That's actually a really funny story. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. We're gonna have to cut that clip out and then uh, use that clip. That's a that's hysterical. That reminds me because it's like you know when me and Brian were coming up, there's so much in the language barrier. You know, you know. Portuguese and Brazilian and learning. I mean, especially yeah. when we started in '99, you know. So like, there was a warm up we would do, and uh, it was like kind of like a karaoke kind of thing, crossing your legs and your arms when you're running and sideways. And they would, they, we, it sounded like they were calling it break dance. Yeah. We're like, okay, you know what I mean? You're crossing your feet. 15 years go by, and even us as instructors are calling it break dance, and all of a sudden they're like, break dance? It's Greek dance. <laughs> like, like Greek dance? Why the fuck Greek? Yeah, we, yeah. 
But, you know, talk about something yeah. that'll go 15 years without even knowing what they were saying, you know, which, I mean, that could speak about jujitsu where, I mean, even though language barriers, you know, are tough sometimes, it's still more about, you know, the techniques and the mat time, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty funny sometimes when you're like, what just happened there? <laughs> were they just so, like, How about adjusting to, like, so you said you were, you initially went to Japan, would you say 2006? Yeah, 2006, yeah, okay. long time now. So culture shock, what was that like? It was a good culture shock. Japan's a pretty good place. Um, you, you know, as a foreigner, you're always an outsider there, but uh, the better my Japanese language skills became, uh, the more fun Japan became as well. And, uh, you know, very, very, very different place than I grew up in Silicon Valley. And uh, okay. very different place than, than Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, there are definitely lots of great things about it. But uh, it was a little bit, uh, more than a little bit disappointing to see uh, with the coronavirus stuff. They basically use it as, as an excuse to kick every single foreigner and keep every single foreigner out of the country. And uh, really, really sad to have seen that happen. So, Wow. So being being in being in electronic space, that's what drove you to Japan because the connection between Silicon Valley and Japan. I mean, there's so many companies that you know are Japanese companies that are in Silicon Valley and vice versa, right? Yeah, that would sound cooler, but no, I was I was chasing a girl, and <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh, yeah, man, being in electronics and Japan, you know, it's sort of <laughs> yeah. I was never into anime like that. That wasn't my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like business related. You're like, I was in the computer parts, only computer parts. <laughs> yeah. what, um, uh, actually, China was a much better place for the for the business wide stuff. But uh, yeah, a lot of people yeah. that have, if you've never been to Ch Japan or China, you won't realize. But it's absolute night and day difference. So uh, totally. Yeah, well, totally Japan, different. just from what I've heard, is just such a different. I mean, I mean, obviously culture, but just everything how how they are, how they you know how they act. Uh, everything's so clean, right? Is everything just like very clean in certain aspects it's a city like in city wise yeah um, everything's super clean and organized and i guess one example of this you know going to school in the u.s as a kid there's janitors that clean everything up and the kids make a big mess and the janitors clean it up in japan there's no janitors at the school the kids all have to keep everything clean all the time so then i think that lasts into adulthood the, the, <laughs> the adults are now very conscientious about everything and keeping it clean and not making a mess and not expecting there just to you know, be janitors everywhere to clean everything up all the time. And so it's very nice to see just how clean and tidy they managed to keep everything. And uh, I think America could learn something from the, the cleanliness and tidiness that uh, we see on display in Japan. We know about the needing of cleanliness in jujitsu and hygiene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the only time I ever got you know a, a MRSA or a staph infection was uh, training on some dirty mats in the US. I've never had anything <laughs> in Japan. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I remember when I went to, went to Brazil in 2011 and, and you know, there was no washer dryers. They just had the second floor was open ceiling and they just hung their geese to dry for the next day. I'm like, you guys don't wash your geese, you know? Um, like the sunlight will kill everything. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm like, man, that was my week uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, but um, switching back to crypto a bit, what do you, what are you expecting from, uh, from Biden this week? Anything? Uh, so I, I'm not even an American anymore. I renounced my U.S. citizenship quite a while ago yeah. now, and I, I, it, it's really a liberating feeling. I, I pay less and less attention to the American politics, and when I do hear something about it, I think to myself, "That's not my problem anymore." And so it's mm. uh, so. Oh, that's got to be nice. That's got to be. It really is a nice feeling, and uh, you know, we're recording this. I'm in the beautiful island of St. Kitts. I, I uh, see the palm trees in the back in the reflection. <laughs> yeah, and so like you can use Bitcoin Cash pretty much every single place in the whole country. You can every wow. restaurant, the gas station, the supermarkets, everywhere here. Uh, wow. It's really amazing. And then at the end of the year, I don't even have to file a tax return at the end of the year, so I don't have to report anything. It's really a a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And so if any Americans are feeling tired of America, come give St. Kitts a visit. You can become a citizen in about three months. You can pay for the whole thing in cryptocurrency. Uh, it's really a, a fun place. And uh, and the jiu-jitsu is getting better. It's not that great here at the moment, but it's getting better. So. Okay, you just need a handful of training partners that are dedicated, man. You know, yeah. that's, that's the reality. I want, I want to go out on a limb a little bit and get your opinion and maybe uh, see where we can go with this. But we have a, a new software coming out soon. We're not going to release it yet. But uh, it's going to be, you know, to really forward jujitsu and academy owners specifically and academies. But we were, you know, speculating that even in jujitsu tournaments and, you know, uh, all types of events now that you see worldwide, I really think crypto... I mean, it sounds like Bitcoin Cash would be a great um, opportunity mm -hmm. for this, but a way where you can have competitions where people not only can win very small amounts of crypto, 
But part of certain competitions gives you access to certain types of crypto wallet. Hey, we set you up with this wallet. You signed up for this competition. I mean, we've never seen that yet in the jujitsu space. You think that's something that could be good? Yeah, and it wasn't possible before crypto. So that's why we haven't seen it yet. But uh, we're working out the exact details for ADCC on how to do some of the prizes in Bitcoin Cash specifically. And then we'll probably get a QR code for you know Gordon Ryan and maybe some of the other fighters where, to where anybody watching can tip right from their phone to the QR code for the fighter and make you know additional prize money for the fighters just like that. So that's uh, pretty cool. We're figuring out the Maybe, exact I mean, details on, on speaking of Mo, we just had him on uh, the other day on our podcast. So that's yeah. going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. That was an amazing podcast. Went into a lot of the history of it, and he mentioned that as well. He mentioned NFTs, um, mm-hmm. you know, ADCC Hall of Fame. So you know, uh, it's, I'm sure. I'm you know when I went to the last ADCC um, as part of the Kasai team, and we were a uh, guest of Mo there. Uh, it was just absolutely insane. And we can um, really, uh, I think, expect the next one to be just that much bigger and, and, yes. and better. And I'm just really happy and to see more that. exciting. Oh, more exciting. But I'm just really, I mean, I'm just really happy to see, some, you know, crypto space, Bitcoin Cash yourself being involved in this. And to be honest, I didn't even know that you trained. Which, now, now we know. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I, as soon as I found out, I'm like, oh, I, I'm sending this guy a message. This has got to, this has got to happen. I mean, the two things I'm really passionate about, and now you can really see it converging, especially when we had Mo on and we learned that that was happening. And now uh, it, it happened right in front of our eyes. I, I think this is going to be the, the beginning, man. That's my, that's my little rant. <laughs> well, I'm going to agree. So I'm, this is the future of payments and, and the future of payments in jujitsu as well and prize money and, and everything else. It's just so much easier than PayPal or a bank or, or any other form of money the world has ever seen before. Now, academies, you, you said in Japan, you know, um, a lot of the transacting you do, it's just like right from your phone, Bitcoin cash, boom, done. It's like normal. In Japan too, but in St. Kitts, which is a little tiny island nation in the Caribbean, mm. you can pay with Bitcoin Cash everywhere in St. Kitts, in the neighboring islands of Antigua and St. Martin. And it's really a, it's really one of the major forms of money here in St. Kitts at this mm-hmm. point, where like people, you know, a big percentage of the businesses the pay, you know, it's credit card cash and Bitcoin Cash are the three ways people are paying. Mm-hmm. And Bitcoin Cash is a significant percentage of the payments at this point. It's really spread uh, deeply throughout the country. Wow. Very okay. cool. That's very cool seeing like like a country use it as like a normalized you know form of payment, right? Like you know, just hey, I can use it everywhere. Yeah, and, and and for people that are interested in that too, there's a, it's you'll be stunned when you see how easy it is. It's like twenty seconds to start accepting Bitcoin Cash at your physical business. There's a website we have POS dot cash. So it stands for point of sale POS dot cash. Literally like twenty seconds, and you just link the 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 cash register to your wallet. And you can start accepting uh, Bitcoin Cash. It's so incredibly easy. I try setting up for a new, you know, credit card processing account in twenty seconds, or a PayPal right. account, or or any other sort of like thing. Whereas this, you're in complete control of your own money. It's literally like twenty seconds. It'll take you to to link it with your your phone, if that. Maybe even ten seconds if you've already done it once before. Awesome. Or, so hmm. easy. So. Wow. And then uh, to switch a little bit back to the jujitsu aspect of things, um, you know, we always say about on, on this podcast how jujitsu is going to better you know, everything you do, your relationships, business. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your start and coming through the ranks and how, how does jujitsu tie into your life and maybe change for the better the way you operate in the crypto space? Oh, the, you, throwing in the crypto space, the end made the question harder. I was gonna say, jiu-jitsu really <laughs> did change every single thing about my life like even literally the way i get in and out of a car seat in the car like i find my legs move differently because of jujitsu than it would have before i did jujitsu or or getting out of bed like i'll you know shrimp my way to the edge of the bed and hop out like yeah. differently than i would have before jujitsu but uh I, I mean, you could have onboard somebody doing the blockchain wars. Yeah, That's right. I, I would have totally been up for, you know, either a, a jiu-jitsu a grappling match or even an MMA match if there had been like a credible uh, opponent on the other side. But uh, <laughs> That's right. You, you, is it funny being up there going, I pretty much kick everyone's ass right now? <laughs> and, and, and people that don't train jiu-jitsu or don't train martial arts, like they don't know. They think that they would have a chance. But there is one guy that was, uh, you know, on the other side of the argument with the scaling board. He had zero martial arts experience, and I was already I was brown belt this time, and had you know, seven years of wrestling as well. Right. Um, and he was talking about how he was going to you know get ready and train for six months and be ready for him. And it's just like, wow, no, Dude, that's yeah. not how it works. And <laughs> luckily, some other people set him straight and said, no, you don't want any of that. But uh, you know, <laughs> if you don't train, you don't know. Like it's just it's just so true. 
yeah, if you haven't tried it, you don't know. But uh, to answer your question about how it affected my crypto life, uh, I think there's two two things: jujitsu, and I don't know if you guys ever played Magic the Gathering when you were younger, but I think both of the Magic the Gathering, which is a card game, and jujitsu, they make you think outside the box. Like when, in normal life, there's you go from A to B to C, and there's just one path for everything. Right. With jujitsu, there's a million different ways to accomplish mm-hmm. your goal, and in Magic the Gathering, you have to think outside the box and find a million different ways to accomplish your goal. And so I think both of jujitsu and Magic apply to crypto as well. In crypto, there's a million different ways to do things. And so whatever the end goal is, you can find a million different paths to get there. And if one path doesn't work, try another path, try another one, and just go down these thought experiments in your mind until you find the path that looks like it's going to get you to whatever your goal is there. And for me, the goal is, you know, peer-to-peer electronic cash for every single person on the entire planet where people have complete control of their own money. And if it's not Bitcoin or if it's not Bitcoin cash, it'll be something else. But we're going to get there and I want to get there as soon as we possibly uh, can. And so uh, I'm busy working on that every day. And that's the reason uh, I'm probably not a black belt yet is I spent a lot of time in the last 10 years on the crypto stuff and not as much time on the math as I would have liked. But I think I had a nice balance of both. Yeah, that's, I mean, I that's exactly how I would relate the two is because in jiu-jitsu, the goal being, you know, the, the fastest and most efficient route to the submission or winning the match or winning the fight. And there's many different ways to get there and evolution all along the way. Yeah. I mean, it's no one right answer, you know, and there's always the foundation that you need. But then from there, you have to know the rules to break the rules, right? You have to know what, you know, what space you're operating in to get your and accomplish your goal in order yeah. to try to still co- accomplish the goal. But, you know, and you have to understand the underlying concepts in order yeah. to put yeah. those concepts together to, to achieve the goal. And the same is true in jujitsu versus, uh, versus crypto. If you understand the under- underlying concepts of what makes money, money, or, you yes. know, what constitutes a submission and what, where the positions need to be, you can work towards, uh, either of those goals. So. Exactly. Well, I, I just, uh, you know, um, let me see. I had a couple other, questions here um yeah so what uh specifically you said you had a wrestling background before jujitsu and you said you liked you pretty much you prefer to be on top right and then so what about like gi no gi uh you prefer I've, I've done more gi than no gi, but I'm, I'm just fine with both. Although my, my leg lock game isn't that strong. I have, uh-huh. you know, uh, like most guys that started in the gi, our, our leg lock game isn't yeah. that strong. But I've, I've been working on that a little bit the last year and definitely have improved uh, my leg lock defense. My leg lock offense isn't that strong yet. And, you know, I'm, I'm, those heel hooks are a little bit scary because the range of movement before you have a submission and you actually hurt somebody is so yes. smaller than with like mm-hmm. an arm bar or, or something else. So, uh I'm still cautious. And I, I had a torn ACL a couple of years back and like, it's, you know, it's not fun to be hurt or to actually hurt your opponent. You just want to let them know, Hey, I could hurt you, but you should give up. And then that's the end of it. But, uh, right. my game has actually progressed a lot. Maybe it's with age or maybe it's cause I had my mind blown one time. Uh, when I was a purple belt visiting a, a dojo in Vietnam, the black belt instructor there, you know, as a purple belt, I felt I had a pretty good grasp of the different mm-hmm. positions, but mm. He caught me with a wrist lock out of nowhere while I was in his guard, and it just blew my mind. And so recently, I've been a, I've been, you know, enjoying wrist locks a little bit more. Which you know, some people say it's it's you know cheap or whatnot, but uh, yeah. they're everywhere. And uh, you know, I'm 43 now, so like my my strength and my power, my stamina is not as good as it used to be. But you know, wrist locks, they're they don't take as much strength or stamina or power. You just have to recognize them when they're there. So I've been uh, enjoying those for a while now as well. Yeah, the, the wrist locks for me, when I'm on top and past somebody's guard and side control, when they start to, you know, post it. Yep, there's wrist lock right, right there. there. That's right exactly there. where you get them, you know. Yep. I call them 3D wrist locks because usually when you think wrist lock, you think like Aikido or Japanese Jiu-Jitsu where you're doing stuff like this or, you know, Steven Seagal. But I call it a 3D wrist lock because this is really a 2D. There's only two points of contact. 3D, you're using your body more. And yeah, then you're yeah. Anytime that. they frame against me, it's like, thank you for the wrist lock is, is how I feel. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. I really like to get different aspects of different people that we have on. Um, so yeah, I just really appreciate you coming on. What's the best way, uh, you know, people can follow you social media and hey, told everyone to email. <laughs> uh, I, I got a little bit, you know, tired out with this whole, you know, Bitcoin civil war thing that went on. So I've been taking a break mainly from social media. If, if you want to, you know, my Instagram is not as exciting as the damn Bozarians or anything like that, but I'm yeah. at Roger on Instagram. And maybe I'll come back to Twitter at some point. I'm at Roger K. Veer on Twitter uh, as well. But I'm, I'm kind of slow on the social media stuff at the moment and enjoying uh, 
you know, working on some other things a bit more quietly and then uh, training jujitsu, of course, as well. That's right. Well, guys, definitely, um, you know, follow those and keep an eye on uh, Bitcoin Cash out there in the crypto space. And uh, let's keep an eye out on ADCC. Uh, it's going to be a big event. We're going to see the crypto space really come yeah. into the grappling space, I think. And then I think that's going to start something really big for us in the sport uh, for years to come. And, uh, you know, I think everybody here owes it to themselves to look into, uh, in general, blockchain technology, Absolutely. crypto space. Um, you know, it's definitely the future. It's it's here to stay. And it's, um, I mean, a guy like Roger to, to be in, how uh, an, an OG pioneer, man, I can only imagine. And, you know, me starting two years ago, that's even early with as far as the technology goes, you know, it's like the dot com boom in the 90s. Uh, you know, it's it's even earlier than that. Um, so you guys owe it to yourself. Look into all of this and um, follow Roger. Uh, make sure you guys like and subscribe. We're going to be putting some clips up. Roger, stick around. We'll end the show. See you guys.